Yeah, I mean, I think people are starting to feel guilty about their plastic consumption. You know, it's not, it's no longer, you know, relegated to the, the, the hyper, um, you know, sustainable tree hugging hippie stereotype, right? This is about the average person thinking a little bit more when they make decisions, purchasing decisions, right? Do I really, do I really want the, the produce that's been packaged in multiple shells of packaging? Or can I just go get an apple and like bring it to the checkout without putting it into a bag? Hey, everyone. Our guest today is Mitch Heinrich, a seasoned designer who has worked on numerous projects throughout his career. Mitch spent his early career supporting the launch of a number of successful technology companies, and in 2009, he became the founding and lead designer at Phoenix International, a startup dedicated to bringing affordable renewable energy to the developing world. In 2011, Mitch was hired at Google X, where he led the Design Kitchen team. After Google, Mitch became the Senior Director of Special Projects at Bolt Threads, where he founded and managed the Bolt Project Studio, a team that infused passion for design, materials, and craft into the field of sustainable biomaterials. Today, Mitch works with Checkerspot to animate Checkerspot's materials, intriguing characteristics, and charismatic end uses to drive adoption, and he also is working on getting Checker Spot materials into the hands of other innovators like himself. Welcome to the show, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. You have quite the past. Uh, that was quite the tongue twister for you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, overall, you've been a part of many different and uh, diverse projects over your career in an innovation role. Uh, what common threads have you seen throughout your career? And what does being an innovator mean to you? Yeah, great question. So um, I guess starting with the innovator piece, uh, the way that I view innovation, I mean, it's, it's become kind of this amorphous term that is encompassing of a lot of things. Um, the way that I view innovation, it's, it's a, a state of mind and it's, a, it's an approach to problem solving where you're coming at it from a different perspective, right? You're looking at things and you're questioning why are they the way they are and maybe there's a better way to do it. Um, and then in terms of the common threads throughout my career, I mean, yeah, it seems like the innovation path is in, in some circumstances, it's, it's basically going at it the hard way, thinking about uh, you know, reinventing things that have already been solved, um, but going after it with, again, that, that new perspective. Um, like an example of that uh, at Bolt Threads, like you can make hats and clothes out of acrylic and, and polyester and all kinds of off the shelf inexpensive ingredients. So why would you try to engineer a new microbe to produce a new protein to then figure out how to turn it into one of these items of clothing that's already out there. So, you know, I look at it as, as going after uh, hard, hard challenges and, uh, and hopefully, you know, through the lens of making the world a better place. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. When you talk about out of the box thinking, it's very easy for us to run into common threads and ruts almost. So you've almost made a common thread of not having a common idea. <laughs> um, kind of how do you like continually push yourself not to just think in the same ways? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's about um, getting myself involved with a cohort of people that, that tends to think a little bit differently just by, by the, the nature of, of how they were brought up and, and um, you know, the way that they educated themselves um, and sort of, you know, gaining that through osmosis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's for me, a lot of it is understanding the tools and, and starting to apply them to problems in the world. So, uh, you know, having that curiosity of like, well, how is that made? Um, what's that thing made out of? Uh, and, and trying to understand uh, the world in a, in a slightly more deep way that then opens up questions like, why, why did they choose that process? Why did they choose that material? And um, yeah, it, you know, thinking of it more from the fundamentals and, and first principles. Um, I think that's, for me, that's kind of been the, the common thread, even though I've worked throughout, you know, biotech and renewable energy and mm -hmm. consumer products and consumer electronics, things like that. That was a big piece of advice that we learned with Dr. Haskell Beckham in episode 13 was understanding the first principles. So many people kind of tend to forget it when they they gain more and more experience in the industry, but that tends to lead to a lot of innovation. So it's good to see that you kind of support that same point. And going off of that, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned 
the state of mind. And I'm sure having other innovators around you definitely helps with that. How do you put yourself in that position and in that mindset? Ooh, I love that question. Um, you know, I, I think some of it has to do with putting your own mark on the world and, and not accepting uh, what is given to you. And so it's a little bit of a, a rebel perspective and, and a little bit of a, um, you know, not accepting the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the mindset is like, yeah, surely the person who developed this solution was smart and was working with the best that they had at their, at their disposal at the time. But, you know, times have changed. People are different. We know a lot more, a lot more now. And maybe there's a better way to solve this problem. Absolutely. So let's dive into potentially one of your personal projects. You know, on your website, you mentioned that you've done work on a new type of wind turbine in the form of a UAV. So what exactly makes that technology unique compared to traditional wind turbines? Uh, yeah, so this company is uh, a startup called Makani Power that uh, I was involved with in the very early stages and then left to go do some other things and then actually came back and worked on it a little bit more um, as it was as brought into Google X while I was there. And so the, the idea started with uh, a bunch of us were into kite surfing at the time. Um, and, and for those unfamiliar kite surfing, you basically have this giant kite and you've got the equivalent of like a wakeboard that you strap to your feet and, and you're using wind similar to a windsurfer, but um, you have the ability to do these, these huge jumps and, and go quite fast. There's, there's an incredible amount of power that can be generated with one of these kites. And so the insight was, well, if you can generate this much power with a kite, could you not use that same physics to generate electricity? Um, in, in a way, you know, it was thinking about as we, as we developed this idea and worked through it and, and learned how to simplify it and approach the problem, um, the physics became a little more simple. And the more you look into it, the, the existing wind turbines, the greatest amount of electricity is generated at the tip of the turbine blades. So if you think about the angular velocity, right? That's the tip of the turbine is going the fastest because it's yes. got more distance to travel per revolution. And so with Makani Power, we were basically trying to get rid of the west, rest of the turbine. We just wanted the, the tip of the blade going at that speed and getting rid of the mass of the rest of the turbine. And so the technology uh, is a, a tethered kite that is a, a carbon fiber kite that looks a lot like a UAV. Um, and in the most current version, it's, it's the size of a small passenger airplane. It's huge. Um, it has uh, eight uh, propellers on it that are actually turbine blades that are driven by the wind that, that is generated crosswind as it's flying in circles. So think of, yeah, the, the, the circle that the tip of a turbine blade uh, inscribes as it's going through of a traditional turbine, as it's going uh, through its, its rotation. Um, this kite is flying in that same exact circle, but the wind gener is being generated by the lift of the kite and the, its mm -hmm. speed relative to the, to the crosswind. So yeah, uh, really cool technology, um, generates a ton of power, way more complicated than the existing <laughs> technology, right? It's doing it the hard way. Yeah, uh, but the goal is to to remove the mass, to increase the mm -hmm. the uh, energy output per per square mile, essentially, of an installation. And when you talk about the construction of the the like the aircraft, like first off, a commercial airplane is huge. But why was carbon fiber like your first choice? And like uh, as us as material scientists, like thinking about the first principles, like what was your thinking behind that? Yeah, so. The whole goal is for this thing to go as fast as it can, um, you know, while staying safe and, and not shattering into a thousand pieces. <laughs> um, so part of that is that it's essentially the same reason that airplanes these days are becoming lighter weight. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a savings in fuel with a traditional airplane where you have less mass to move uh, and less mass to keep off the ground. Uh, in our case, it was essentially taking that, that energy savings and, and shifting it into the generation. So it can generate more electricity by being lighter weight and moving faster through the air with the same amount of, of um, lift generated. Um, yeah, carbon fiber uh, is sort of the industry standard for a lot of, of applications in aerospace these days. It's very strong. Um, it's become a lot more uh, reliable and repeatable in the early days of carbon fiber. Um, 
you know, it's, it's essentially this craftsman bespoke material where you're laying it by hand. And so there's a lot of variation that can be imposed into the process, um, depending on who's doing it, what's the temperature that day, um, how much attention to detail is being put into it. Um, and so nowadays, yeah, it's become more of a science and, and the composites industry has really figured out how to, how to productionize it. Uh, and so we're taking advantage of a lot of that material science and a lot of that knowledge gained over the last decades as carbon fiber technology has matured. Wow. So since that was one of your earlier projects, where is that technology now, since there also has been advancement of materials, including carbon fiber over the past decade or so, like you mentioned? Yeah, so um, that technology, uh, as I understand it, has sort of um, shifted gears, where Makani is a company, uh, it was a startup and it was uh, venture funded. It got acquired by Google X. Uh, it was really put in a high gear at Google X, a ton more investment went into it. They did a big offshore installation in Norway, which was really exciting to see. Um, and then most recently, uh, the, the industry has caught up in terms of traditional wind turbines and wow. they can make wind turbines efficient and less expensive mm -hmm. um, compared to what we were working on. And so Google made the decision to, to um, turn down that project. But what was really cool about what they did in terms of shutting that project down is that they open sourced all of the data and all of the control mm -hmm. systems and everything learned through that process. And there's a number of other startups that have taken that technology and that knowledge and mm -hmm. are carrying it on. Um, there's also a great um, uh, short documentary that a friend of mine produced about Makani that you can find on YouTube. I suggest taking a look. <laughs> uh, that's unfortunate it didn't work out, but I, I really like how they open sourced it because we can learn a lot from each other and a lot is hidden behind IP and other things. Totally, yeah. And, and it's not that the technology doesn't have legs. It's mm -hmm. just that Google X has a super high bar for mm -hmm. what success looks like to them. Um, and there, there's definitely something to this technology. Um, and so I'm really hoping that somebody will commercialize it in a meaningful way. Awesome. Well, you kind of already mentioned this, but changing threads, talking about bolt <laughs> threads, uh, a company focusing on utilizing spider silk and mycelium to create wearable goods. How are we able to create clothing from such unique materials? So the bolt threads technology is, is another one that's, that goes very deep. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they've got two essential technology platforms and their focus is on creating new sustainable materials for clothing and, and consumer goods. Um, so the, the silk technology is when I joined their, um, their flagship and most developed technology. And the idea is uh, you, the spiders, spiders produce this amazing material. Most people are, are aware of its, its incredible properties, right? Greater tensile strength than steel by weight. Um, and so how do, you, how do you make that in a way that's usable uh, in consumer products? It's a natural material, so it's biodegradable um, and it has these incredible properties. So uh, Bolt uh, was able to take the protein sequence that is found in spiders spider silk specifically, and um, turn that into genetic code that's inserted into a yeast. And that yeast then is fermented, a yeast or a bacteria, it's fermented kind of like brewing beer. Uh, and then the output from that fermentation process is purified um, and you end up with like a spider silk slurry or a powder. And then we were creating threads from that that we we're using for clothing. Um, also, it turns out that it makes for an interesting um, cosmetics ingredient. It's got really interesting um, uh, like moisture barrier properties to it. Um, but then also some of the stuff that I was working on while I was there was uh, developing processes in order to compress it into solids. Um, so think of a plastic replacement made out of a, a spider silk. And so, um, yeah, the goal there is, you know, again, going after the hard way, thinking about how you can change the, the material world that we live in for the better um, by establishing new, more sustainable alternatives. Um, we made hats and ties, we made cosmetics. I made a pair of glasses, uh, multiple <laughs> pairs of glasses out of spider silk. Um, yeah, so like that's, that was kind of the goal behind the silk and, and uh, it's, it's seen some success. Um, the other piece of technology that they've been working on that has really become their flagship in recent years uh, is Milo, which is a, a mycelium-based leather 
So mycelium is, people call it the root structure of a mushroom. It's mm -hmm. essentially what happens underground um, where the, the reality and truth is that the mushroom is just the fruiting body of the organism, right? It's imagine like an apple tree, it's the apple part of it, that's the mushroom, um, where the rest of the tree in the apple analogy is what's happening underground. And so the Milo technology takes that mycelium and sort of tricks it into growing up aerially out of like a sawdust substrate. Um, and, and then that aerial growth is kind of like this big fluffy pillow. We were then able to process in different ways to create leather alternatives. Um, and just recently, a lot of announcements have gone out. It's really exciting to see that it's making its way into the consumer market. Um, Adidas announced that they're making a Stan Smith shoe out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Lululemon is also part of the, part of the um, commercialization effort, as well as a couple other companies like Stella McCartney. So, um, so yeah, this is, again, it's about like, let's, let's swap out ingredients and try to make something that's different and better for not only the world, but also potentially the consumer, because we now have greater control over the, the, the end of material properties when you pay as much attention as, as we have to these things. Yeah. So from the, or the bio inspired design process is super interesting to me. So with the spider silk side of things, do you do extensive research into like how a spider's spinneret works and then take that into account with the design process or how exactly does that work from the designer's perspective? Yeah. So spider butts are incredible. <laughs> they, like, it's, it is basically impossible to replicate in a commercial technology for high throughput manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, there are processes that happen in the spider spinneret that are, they require a level of control that is really hard to replicate. So there's things like pH gradients and salinity gradients and, um, and aperture sizes that only work at very small scales that are hard to re replicate. So, so yes, like tons of, of uh, understanding and primary research into how it's done in nature. But the reality is when you're trying to build a new technology like this and um, make it ready for um, like mass customer adoption, you have to find new alternatives, right? You have to take what kind of exists in uh, the, the manufacturing world today and, and what the material needs as a, a processing constraint and sort of find that middle ground. Um, it's kind of, it's unrealistic in my, in my opinion to create entirely new um, manufacturing uh, processes for one specific material, unless you've got you know, decades of runway in terms of time and, and money. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I mean, we were looking at, uh, and, and they continue to look at um, how you can adapt some of the existing technologies for spinning, spinning fibers. It's like, that's the term that they use for extruding a fiber um, and, and having spider silk, these recombinant spider silks as in like silks that were derived, they were secreted from the non-native organism um, and, and adapting them to those processes. So yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a process of figuring out what exists in, in industry and then figuring out what tweaks you can make to those processes to get them to work for your material. Yeah. It's tough, it's super tough. <laughs> Yeah, when you're talking about taking the hard way, that may be one of the hardest ways I've ever heard of to get to a shirt. <laughs> but yeah. I guess when we take a step back and I've done an innovation um, internship and during that internship, the thing that resonated with me the most is that innovation is like difficult in definition. If you can have an innovation that becomes cheaper and better for a consumer, then it's a blowout. You're going to do it easily. But most innovations lie where the increase in price comes with some increase in value, right? And so that's where like the like the other properties come into play. But I guess you've gone to a lot of these projects at the very start, like when at the very beginning of projects, when we look like years down the road, because you can't figure out how to do this overnight, what are some of the things that you look at to make sure that hey, this makes sense and we're just not wasting time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that we used to think about a lot while I was at Google X. Um, as a part of that early stage pipeline and assessing new technologies um, and, and new directions to go, um, you know, there's like, there's methods of doing what's called a techno-economic analysis mm -hmm. and, and sort of painting the picture in numbers through spreadsheeting and, and other tools to figure out if something's gonna make sense mm -hmm. uh, economically. Um, down the road, 
you know, where you have, you just start putting stakes in the ground and say, okay, we expect it to cost this much in our raw materials, this much in processing. These are the steps that we know today that are more, most likely to be required for this technology to exist in the world. And so you, you start doing that, um, that analysis and sometimes it pans out and sometimes it doesn't, but where I see um, a huge amount of value in the innovation process is not sticking so closely to those types of analyses and, and using your gut and, and having a hunch and pursuing it. And sometimes you don't know what the destination looks like specifically, but you have a hunch that, you know, if I made, a, if I made this material that performed better than cotton or acrylic or, or, you know, the incumbent plastics, for instance, and it was more sustainable that the world needs this and, and it, it's worth it, uh, you know, doing some investigation into to see if we can make this happen. Um, because as you go through the process of experimentation, often new, new opportunities present themselves that you, had, you would never have been able to foresee at the outset. So, so part of it is, okay, very traditional, like let's just write down everything and, and be explicit about our assumptions in both variables and constants. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it is, what's your gut tell you? Should this exist in the world? And what are the biggest, um, the biggest pieces of unknowns? And this is something that, that Google X likes to talk about and really reinforce. It's about going after the hardest parts first mm -hmm. so that you can retire that risk. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, if you've got a new technology and, and the biggest question is whether the consumer is going to be excited about it. And, and you, you, know, you figure that the manufacturing costs are something that you can figure out later and that they all seem pretty reasonable. Well, then before you even make the thing, go and ask a bunch of people, like find a way to retire that risk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like those are the two pieces of the equation as I see it. It's great mm -hmm. if the techno-economic analysis helps to you know, reinforce your, your assessment and your opinion and your assumptions. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of it is like, don't let that get you down if it doesn't pan out at first blush and really track down on your hunch and, mm -hmm. and discover new things and be, be open to new inspiration through the process. Mm -hmm. So with these projects, you started with this synthetic silk and the mycelium, and then you were able to have that freedom to determine which of which applications it could be used for. How does that mindset differ from having an end application that you need or a target application and then having to determine the proper materials that could achieve that at a better rate than what was previously used? Yeah, so in, in the world of industrial design, which is what I studied, you're kind of looking at um, applications, specific applications for products. So often, you know, as an industrial designer, you'll get contracted to design a new widget, right? Maybe it's a new pair of eyeglasses, maybe it's a new water bottle or it's, it's something. And then you have the freedom to go and select the material that best fits that application, right? Uh, and sometimes you can be clever and cute and find like materials that are close but different that give you a bit of differentiation in the market, right? Um, but in, in my career, I've had the opportunity to work in reverse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of speaks to understanding the deeper piece of the science and understanding like what are the materials properties and what does it want to be? And then pursuing those applications from there. So, you know, that's something that I worked on a lot at, at Bolt and I'm now uh, able to, to collaborate on with Checker Spot these days. Um, you know, when you've got a, a spider silk and it has specific properties, um, Let's say it's really expensive. Let's say it, you know, has um, really interesting like water absorption uh, um, properties. Mm -hmm. Then you start tracking on, okay, like where, where are applications where that could be a really big benefit? Where is, it, where is it unique and where does it excel compared to the incumbent materials, the things that are already out there? Um, so like, I'll give an example. Uh, and it's not, it's not a secret because uh, it's out there in the world. Um, but it's really quirky and fun. Uh, while I was at Bolt and we were working on the very first pro uh, consumer product, uh, it was a tie. It was like a men's knit tie. This blue tie is beautiful. Um, and it was the first product that was made from our, our spider silk fiber uh, technology. And there's a really intriguing material property to spider silk that is found in nature. 
and it's got this really important function in nature. So the, the feature is called super contraction. And the function is as a spider spins its web, it, it wants a tight web because it's got to be able to capture prey and it's got to be able to sense through vibration where that, that it has captured prey. And so super contraction is spider silk's ability to contract in length by a significant percentage in order to stay taut. And so like the dew in the morning and the moisture in the air keeps it taut. So we were able to produce a spider silk that had super contraction to an incredible degree. It actually shrunk by, by length as much as 40%. Wow. Where like a cotton fiber is gonna be in the single digit percents. And so it's this new, uh, this new characteristic that's not available in any other fiber out in the world. And so it gets your brain going into, well, where could that be a really unique uh, differentiator? Like, how do we get into casts, right? Thinking about like setting someone's arm if they've gotten a broken arm or leg, where that, or, or compression socks or things where that, that uh, act of putting it into place and then shrinking it would be an advantage. Um, so it, it requires a level of creativity and, and sort of like just a general kind of knowledge and understanding of what exists in the world in terms of product categories and requirements. Um, but it, it's fun because it frees your mind up to not be so specialized, right? There's plenty of industrial designers in the world that specialize in like one particular product category, right? All I design are laptops. All I design is, you know, some sort of, uh, esoteric um, medical device that only a handful of doctors use in the world. Yeah, no, that's absolutely crazy that you found out that this material has the super contraction property. And then now the possibilities are endless for the applications that um, you could derive from it. But let's pivot to your projects with Google for a moment where you kind of had an end idea or end goal in mind. So you were involved in the creation of their smart contact lens to collect and monitor blood glucose data for diabetes patients. And so I know you know this, but for context to our listeners, millions of Americans have to prick themselves multiple times a day to test their blood levels. But these contact lenses would integrate a glucose monitor to get continuous measurements, I believe, from people's uh, tear fluids. So can you talk us through this design process, if, any, if anything I said was wrong, and the interesting materials you came across during this process? Yeah, so, so you are right. You know, diabetes is a huge problem. Um, and I want to add a little more context to uh, the problem set, which sure. is, um, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm, I'm like speaking from what I understand, but, you know, I didn't go to school for this. <laughs> um, so there's two versions of diabetes. There's type one and type two diabetes. Type two is the most common, and it's where your body um, is, is not as efficient at its insulin regulation, and it doesn't respond as, as well as it should. Um, to, to sway, you know, shifts in blood sugar. Um, type one diabetes is less common, but it's, it's far more severe. And so type one diabetics actually don't produce insulin. And so they need insulin, otherwise they die. And so a type one diabetic, because they have no ability to regulate their, their blood sugar, um, require continuous monitoring. So a type one diabetic often has this like subcutaneous probe. They've got like a thing that's stuck into their stomach um, and is attached to a fanny pack and it's continuously monitoring their blood sugar level so that they can act quickly should it spike or drop uh, precipitously. And so they, they're on a much tighter regulation in terms of you know, needing to know what their blood sugar is every five minutes. And so that was the, the application that we were pursuing is, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to have this giant fanny pack, continuous blood glucose monitor that's got like a probe that's stuck literally into your stomach? Um, and you could just wear something as, as commonplace as a contact lens. So, so that was the, the prompt. It was how do we, how do we make uh, life meaningfully better for people with di type one diabetes? And once we developed this platform, which is a contact lens and an a ASIC, which is a, a integrated microcontroller, a tiny little chip, um, there might be other interesting applications for this type of miniaturization of technology and sensing. Um, so I was, at, part of my role at, at Google X was um, I had started a group called the Design Kitchen and it's 
its goal was to aid in the prototyping and development and manufacturing and just realization of a ton of new ideas. So oftentimes we were partnered with physicists or software engineers or you know, crazy mad scientists who had ideas and needed help sort of visualizing what it was that they had in their mind. And so, so my team, the Design Kitchen, uh, got to work on this smart contact lens project and, and work through some of the challenges around um, how do you manufacture it? Are there clever things that we can do that pull from other adjacent industries to make this cheaper and more effective? Um, so some of the challenges in that project were like making this thing biocompatible, like you're all of a sudden putting something that is like a foreign object, like a, a small sensor. And if you go and look up the, uh, look it up on, on the web, um, you'll see there's also an antenna that's integrated into the contact. It's like this ring antenna that goes around sort of the iris of your eye. Um, and so now you're, you're like packing a bunch of junk into this contact lens that um, has, has this now dual function of, well, it's got to sense stuff, so you need to make it out of a material that um, you can put a little hole in, like a port, to allow mm -hmm. the tear film to, to flow back and forth. But you can't have any sharp edges. You can't have that little sensor scraping on someone's eye. Um, and then the other piece of it is it, it can't mess up someone's vision, right? Like, it would, that would be a bad trade-off. Like, you can barely see, but it, con it, it senses your, your tear film flow or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's like this optical component as well. And so um, I'll, another big piece of it is how do you get the data off of it? And, and how do you power this thing? And so those were the types of challenges that we, we faced and, and we were working with, with the technical team on to help put together. One of the things that we were able to do that was a super fun part of that project was develop a pair of glasses. So it was kind of interesting that you're wearing a contact lens, but then you have to wear a pair of glasses over the top. <laughs> but this was for our clinical trials and getting through that process. But the, the glasses that my team developed was, um, they, they incorporated an antenna as well inside the frame and, and a Bluetooth module and a battery pack and all this stuff so that you could energize the, the um, contact lens, get the data off of it, send it to your phone, but all in a package that looked like a totally normal pair of glasses. Wow. Yeah, so just to start off, like you mentioned that there's like an optical challenge, there's a biocompatibility challenge. So it sounds like a huge material selection problem. Like, how did you go about selecting a material to solve it? And like, what material did you guys end up using? Yeah, so um, the material challenge on the contact lens itself, uh, we were pulling from what current disposable contacts are made from, uh, which is a silicone material. Silicones are, are great for biocompatibility. But yeah, there's a whole, a whole challenge around making silicone lenses in, in a two-part design. Um, and also what grade of silicone do you choose? Because our application is a little bit different than the standard one where we needed a little more rigidity and we needed a little better um, self-adhesion because uh, the way that our contact was produced was in like two shells that you were able to like clamshell together over the sensor. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a big piece of it. Also turns out in the... Um, in the industry, when you're making contact lenses, the way that they're molded is that each mold is disposable. So you're not using the same mold to create a whole bunch of contact lenses from it. For sterility and um, for like mold integrity, they actually do an injection molding process of the mold itself that then the contact lens is molded into. So it's this like weird Russian nesting dolls arrangement <laughs> in terms of... Um, manufacturing processes uh, that we had to start adopting and, and figuring out how to make it work right. But yeah, like what are those molds made out of? I, and usually those were, they also had to be a, a biocompatible material because any polymer could be left on the contact lens um, and how do you produce those in quantity? So yeah, tons of material challenges on, I mean, that, that is a continuous thread through a lot of the projects that I've worked on. When you're <laughs> sort of going back to first principles and reevaluating, how and why we arrived at the solution that is currently prevalent today, you're often questioning the materials piece of it. What, what was it made from? Why did they choose that? Is there something new and different that's better today that didn't exist 20 years ago when they first came up with this idea? Mm -hmm. Were there any like cost challenges? I assume that it's uh, a little bit more expensive when you're incorporating like the sensor technology and everything else that goes into play. So how did you factor all of that 
into this design process? Certainly we're looking at costs throughout the process, but um, especially when you're going after these big innovative projects, that becomes, frankly, in a lot of circumstances, something that you push off to uh, later, right? It's, it's, a, it's sort of a two-step process, I should, maybe a three-step process. There's sort of the analysis stage in the beginning, like I was talking about before, that techno-economic analysis. Then there's the development piece where it's like, can we even do it? Um, what can we learn through prototyping and development and testing? And then there's the cost down and scale up and all of those manufacturing related challenges that need to be ironed out in order to hit what's called unit economics, positive unit economics, right? Each one needs mm -hmm. to make money. Um, so yeah, with that project, um, I think, I think the, that particular application, the contact lens, it turned out that um, it's hard to correlate. And this is again, challenging your, your um, assumptions that it's hard to correlate the tear film uh, glucose level with your blood glucose level, that mm -hmm. those two things don't necessarily always track perfectly with each other. Gotcha. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned before, like you discover things through the process. That was one of the things that, that was discovered, but also um, now they've got this interesting sensing platform and there's other ways to sense blood glucose. And so you can imagine that same technology being applied to things like band-aids or, mm -hmm. or other, other ways of trying to access that, um, that sampling. Um, of, of your blood. Yeah, I, I've actually seen there's like little like um, almost like circle band-aids that you stick on your arm and uh, it's like it hooks up to your phone and just pings you whenever you need uh, blood glucose. Is that like the same type of technology? I'm not familiar with that specific technology, but but it does sound like it. Um, gotcha. I, I think that the dermal patch makes a lot more sense. And often I think they have these little micro needles Mm -hmm. So that you can actually, you know, without feeling it, you can, you can sample blood glucose level. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think one very interesting thing that I've kept on hearing from you is that a lot of times in school and like in, in like real business, like people are like a lot of engineering projects fail because they don't think about cost. And now you're telling me, don't think about cost and have a vision. <laughs> and so I guess like, I guess that's really what it means to like be innovative is that like, if the product is gonna work and you have belief that it's gonna work and it's gonna change things, um, that it doesn't really matter what the price is, it'll like work itself out in the end, as long as you're being practical along the way. Um, how hard is it to like have belief in like your product's goal when like some of the economics may be like, not like great signs? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a little bit of hubris, if I'm honest, right? <laughs> You're convincing yourself, right? Yeah. And, and I, from my perspective, um, I want to swing for the fences. I, mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's about making huge gains and not incremental gains. Mm -hmm. that, that if I'm going to be investing my time, effort, energy, blood, sweat, tears into something, um, I have a high risk tolerance. And so I want, I'm, I'm okay with investing that into something that may have huge outsized impact if it's successful, but also may not actually work in the end because the economics don't pan out or whatever. Um, and that's not to say everyone should think like I think, um, <laughs> because if everyone thought that way, you know, we'd be, we'd probably have a hard time making anything that was cost effective. <laughs> um, you know, th there's this idea of value engineering or, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of incremental gains. And, and I think there's, there's room for that in the world. And those are things that are important, like those little 5%, 10% gains over time. Um, but my perspective on it, at least, is that I'm here to swing for the fences. Like I wanna, I wanna go after the big hairy problems. I wanna uh, apply my experience, knowledge and insight into something that might you know, totally change things for the better. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's that definitely a balance um, between going big or go home and then also that value engineering, like you mentioned. Um, but just a real quick question about the sensors, because I think that could be really interesting to touch on. What materials were used for those micro sensors, especially in the biocompatibility standpoint? Yeah, so the sensor itself was a, um, it was a custom ASIC. ASIC is an acronym and I'm failing to remember the specifics, but it's essentially like a, a custom integrated microcontroller. So it's like, think of, of a computer chip, but the size mm -hmm. of, you know, a, a, a big flake of salt. <laughs> um, and, and so those are produced on silicon wafers. 
Um, and so that whole process is, has been developed for like the consumer electronics industry. Um, and we're taking that and having to adapt it to a biocompatible application, um, which is kind of this, this relatively new intersection, right? Some of the other things that exist in this space are like pacemakers or, you know, there, there's just a handful of them out in the world where you need something that is both a active computing element or has some sort of integrated um, logic and the human body. So um, it, it was essentially an encapsulation process. Um, one of the big challenges that, that we faced was as you're doing this molding process, not plugging the cavity that this, the tear film needs to be sensed through um, because you could easily just accidentally squirt some uh, silicone, liquid silicone in there and have it harden and then you would be able to sense anything. Um, and so there was a process of figuring out what like a, uh, a sacrificial material could be used to fill that void while it's being molded and then remove from the part after it's been molded. And, and to be frank, I'm forgetting the name of the specific polymer that we found, but it was one that was like a water soluble polymer that did not leave any kind of residue in the cavity. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't foul any um, downstream sensing once the contact lens was molded. Um, but yeah, that was like this whole uh, process of, you know, a little bit of trial and error. Like, okay, is this polymer gonna work? How do we apply it? How do we make it um, disappear when we don't want it anymore? In a yeah. way that again, all is, is biocompatible and, and we're not introducing any weird foreign elements into this device. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't even realize that you would have to have like something that disappears because one of the most important properties is durability, but another <laughs> just as important is being able to be like uh, moved when you want it to be. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, so moving to another Google project you worked on was the self-driving car. While on the surface, it seems like a project that has like a lot more coding and hardware problems, what challenges did you work on as like an industrial design and like on a material standpoint on the project? Yeah, um, so this was a project that again, the design kitchen team at Google X that I had started was focused on and we were doing a little bit of design uh, consulting on it. Um, so the area that I was most involved uh, in, in collaborating with that team was when we were kind of in the early stages of developing the, the, the technology as like a, uh, the LIDAR and the sensing. And, and we were trying to build a, a platform that we could develop a data set and, a, and the algorithm better to, to further um, that piece of it without going full bore, we're designing our own car from you know, start to finish. So we worked on it, what's called a low speed vehicle. And there's some pictures out there, there's some on my website, but it was essentially this cute little golf cart-esque thing. Um, and it was a low speed vehicle. So I think the, the goal was 35 miles an hour max. Um, but when you're designing a low speed vehicle, there's still a bunch of transportation safety requirements that you have to incorporate into those. And so one that, that I had a chance to think about, my team as well, was in the, in the unfortunate event that a pedestrian gets struck by the vehicle, right? Like these things are super rare, but like happen. Um, we, we need to design around that. And how do we, how do we incorporate you know, some smart thinking to make the harm that that would do as minimal as possible or have no impact. So uh, we, got to, <clears throat> we got to think about the, the bumper and what that uh, material is so that you could have a pedestrian, you know, get bonked by this thing <laughs> if they stepped out in front of it and hopefully have them unscathed. Mm -hmm. So we looked at, um, foams, different types of, of polymers. We looked at elastomers, rubbers. We looked at um, meta materials, which is this whole class of materials where you're incorporating um, physical features into the design that have sort of non-linear actions. So, you know, they, they crush in a way that is non-intuitive or can get out of the way um, if they have impact. Um, we looked at things like non-Newtonian fluids. So if you've ever played with Ublek as a kid, right? The idea of like going slow, you can go, you know, through it, you can stick your finger in it, but if you go really hard, it fights back with the, you know, uh, much harder like durometers called, or, you know, it's, it's pushing back harder. Um, so 
you know, we had an opportunity to kind of rethink from the ground up what a bumper is and how it works and, and do a little bit of prototyping on that. Um, ultimately, they decided to um, push towards like partnering with other groups to build vehicles, but there are some prototypes out there. You can see photos of it, of this cute little car. Um, but yeah, material science, again, like it pops its, its head up in a lot of these exciting applications and forward thinking things. Um, because if you're building something fresh from the ground up, like you're making a car that drives itself, like doors wide open, what else can we improve while we're at it? Yeah. Uh, do you see, do you know if that technology or the bumper technology has been improved in other cars? Cause I, I assume that's not just specific for Google self-driving cars that could be ac applicable anywhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I have seen um, some mycelium foams work their way into different applications, um, both packaging, like simple stuff like styrofoam replacements, but I also feel like mycelium foams might be making their way into uh, automotive applications, which is pretty cool. So that's really tackling a different problem, which is that foam is a, is a, a challenging, um, challenging material from a sustainability perspective because it's mostly air. So it takes mm -hmm. up a lot of volume but it doesn't degrade. Uh, and so mycelium is an interesting way to tackle that by having it be made out of a material that is biodegradable. Awesome, awesome. And so your latest work at Checkerspot, moving on to um, where, where you're working at now, um, it seems to stem from the belief that the combination of science, design, and democratization of innovation can unlock the potential that sustainable, sustainable materials have so how can your design experience that we've talked about combine with Checkerspot's biomanufacturing process to change the world of plastics and still maintain that high level of performance and sustainability simultaneously? And what do you think it will take for new materials to become adopted and widely used? So I'm, I'm excited about Checkerspot's materials. Um, Primarily because like this idea of trading off performance and sustainability has historically always been the case. Like the thing that's better for the planet is actually worst for the consumer. Um, you're sacrificing performance, but Checkerspot has found a way to navigate that so that you can have both. You can have a high performing material that is also environmentally preferable. Um, and, and I'm also excited about the Checkerspot stuff because it's a material technology that's like ready to go pretty much. It's very close to commercialization and, you know, it's already made its way out in this, uh, in uh, their skis and it has a ton of potential for growing quickly um, and getting out in the world. So, I mean, I love the idea that like today plastics are made out of like liquid dinosaur bones that are pumped out of the ground <laughs> and, and that checker spots got this like, let's change this, let's flip the script. Like let's use mm -hmm. algae oils and they're renewable and they're, they're using, you know, renewable feedstocks. Um, and also you can tune the properties of them, right? You can, you have access to the, the chemistry at a level that is actually not just chemistry, but also biology um, and, pl and playing around with the, the makeup of their oils. Um, so to get these technologies adopted in the world, I mean, this is what I get excited about. This is, these are the kinds of projects that I love to work on because it really hits this sweet spot for me as an industrial designer where I'm thinking about um, the, the user, the person who's actually, the, the person who's gonna buy it and, and what are their motivations, um, the like culture that it fits in. So, you know, finding a product that's not only the right thing, but also the right place and time, but then also industry and like, what are the requirements for how it's made and how do we work out the production processes and the checker spot material for me hits that bullseye where I get to think about end applications, very charismatic applications of a new technology that's going to open people's eyes to it and get it out there in the world. Um, I get to think about culture, which is, um, you know, what are the applications that we can apply this to that is going to have the broadest reach um, and is going to, you know, I ideally attract more people to these technologies, mm -hmm. even though they're new and not just because they're new. Um, and then finally, industry, like helping to guide this, this technology through feedback as I'm developing prototypes and working out different applications and how it can be tuned to better uh, work its way through the existing manufacturing supply chain, right? So that you don't have to build a factory every time you want to build a new widget, you can take advantage of the existing uh, supply chain that's out there so that, that 
everyone can be a widget producer and really you're just focused on providing the raw materials to enable them. So that's, that's a big piece of it. And then another part is just figuring out how I can get more people like myself to get their hands on this material, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of like nonlinear returns or like having the exponential growth by like, how do we find 50 more Mitches that can get their hands on this material <laughs> so that they can then get it out to the world using their best, you know, powers that they have at their disposal. Yeah, and I guess when we talk about sustainability and performance, like the, the poster child for poor, uh, poor, I mean, good sustainability, but poor performance is of course the paper straw. So when you think of these new applications with a better sustainability story, um, as a designer, like how exciting is that? That And like, what do you think the public appeal will be? Yeah, I mean, I think people are starting to feel guilty about their plastic consumption. You know, it's not, it's no longer, you know, relegated to the, the, the hyper, um, you know, sustainable tree hugging hippie stereotype, right? This is about the average person thinking a little bit more when they make decisions, purchasing decisions, right? Do I really, do I really want the, the produce that's been packaged in multiple shells of packaging? Or can I just go get an apple and like bring it to the checkout without putting it into a bag? Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I think access to sustainable materials is actually a big problem, not only with, I mean, it's driven by consumers largely, and a lot of brands are, are hitting up against this problem where they, they actually want to apply new technologies, new sustainable materials to their, to their product catalog, but those materials are few and far between, often are very expensive or often have some reduced performance characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, so this new generation of, of materials companies like CheckerSpot that are coming on the scene and, and kind of checking all the boxes, mm -hmm. um, I think are gonna open up a lot of, a lot of new brand uh, applications. They're like people are, for instance, like a headphone company might get a ton of feedback from their consumers. Like, I wish that your headphones were not made out of garbage plastic. Um, and, but they have no ability to change that because the, the requirements of the headphone are that it needs to be less expensive. It needs to have a certain amount of like mold, uh, geometry. It's got to hit a certain shape. Um, it's got to have certain acoustic properties, blah, 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 blah. Um, and checker spot can swoop in and be like, Hey, we got all that. Check, check, check. Like mm -hmm. use our material. And so it's, yeah, there's this inflection point that I think is, is beginning to happen where, uh, designers and brands and uh, you know innovators get choices. They've got a broadened palette, which is, I mean, it's the best possible thing. Yeah, when we talk about consumers, one big problem with sustainability is that if we create this plastic that's so great and acts just like plastic, but it's not different from plastic, but it looks the same, consumers are very uneducated in that sense. So as a designer, like, can we almost tell a story with like how you design it or like what type of actions are we taking to differ differentiate this new plastic, which is much more sustainable compared to the old plastic? Yeah, this gets into some, some interesting like consumer uh, behavior and, and consumer mindset stuff that is, is territory that's like not very well trodden because it's, it's kind of a new thing that's come up. Mm -hmm. um, convincing someone that they're not sacrificing is is probably one of the biggest challenges that they're they're not sacrificing by choosing the more sustainable alternative, um, and so like there's a piece of that which is storytelling. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I feel like as a designer, one of my one of my duties and goals in service of the adoption of whatever I'm working on is to help empower the brand, the company, the whoever's um, you know aiming to get this thing out in the world with the with the story that's going to capture the imagination of the consumer in a way that they can identify with it right a lot of people make purchasing decisions for for items in their in their life that they can identify with that tells a story to them that they then want to go and tell their friends about um, when you choose your shoes why do you choose that particular brand and style it says something about you and your identity and um, i think companies like checker spot and bolt threads and this new this new era are they're working their way into that existing um, consumer mentality 
where it's a bit of a nuanced conversation to say like, not only is that the style that I'm interested in, but it's also made out of this material that says something about who I am and what my values are as a person. Um, so yeah, I mean, people are smart in that way. They're sophisticated. They're gonna pick up on that. The tools as a, from a very like aesthetic perspective as a designer that I have at my disposal are, you know, colors, materials, and finishes that, that help to differentiate the product. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Stan Smith Milo shoe, this is the mycelium leather that Bolt Threads has been working on mm -hmm. with Adidas. It's, it looks, it's the same silhouette, the same shape as the existing Stan Smith shoe, which is a very iconic shoe. But mm -hmm. the color that they chose is this like neutral brown leather that is very like different and unique to the Milo material. Um, you know, I think uh, Wonder Alpine's uh, skis, they've got this bright pop of color, right? It's the, it's the yellow that tells the story of like, oh, this plastic is not the plastic that you're, you're used to. This plastic is different. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives that little uh, visual cue that there's more to it. And it's not just an aesthetic um, decision that was made. Cool. So from the sustainability perspective, then what do you think universities should teach to um, in design programs and engineering programs based on all of your experience, um, what skills or what mindset should be taught? Um, I mean, everyone's a designer, whether they realize it or not, right? We all make decisions that affect our lives and, and those decisions can be thought through like, you know, the design process. Um, but I think to take a big step back and, and how I came to be where I am and, and to gain the experience that I've had, a lot of it is really driven off of um, curiosity, just you know, innate curiosity and, and wanting to understand what's a little bit deeper and under the surface and teaching myself, right? A lot of like, to be totally frank, I didn't learn a ton when I went to college. Like I, I studied industrial design. The program that I went to was, um, there were too many kids and not enough teachers. And so I found myself like teaching myself how to like how to do 3D modeling on my own, how to how to go through the design process in a lot of ways on my own. And then once I got into industry, it was about like finding mentors that really embodied the qualities that I aspired to have as I as I progressed along in my career. And so like for me, it's about not not pigeonholing yourself into a specific trade or knowledge set. Like you're not just a material scientist. You're a material scientist, but but this idea of like a T-shaped person is really important. So it, mm -hmm. this is like, I think IDEO was the one that coined it, but you go really deep in one particular area of knowledge, right? Whether it be material science, industrial design, et cetera. But then mm -hmm. you like, there's the top bar of the T, which is like having a breadth of knowledge across many different disciplines and domains. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of people that are gonna have those, those insights and that, that inspiration and, and be generally more effective in their role because they can draw from experiences outside of their domain of expertise to say like, oh, I learned about this thing in this other area, right? This is how they do it in like, you know, automotive design, or this is how they do it when they're selecting uh, elastomers for, you know, foot, like insoles for shoes, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, so for me, it's about, yeah, building those connections, having that broad base of knowledge, but also going deep in one particular area and just mm -hmm. generally being curious, always asking why. Yeah, I think that's a great um, uh, uh, transition to our last question here is that you've had a very wide range of opportunities, but now you have an opportunity to empower innovators in the field of MSc and industrial design and so on. What advice do you have for our listeners who wanna enter the product design realm and use these MSc principles to create meaningful and lasting impact? Um, I think, you know, back to the previous question, it's, it's about like finding people that um, embody those, those characteristics and traits you aspire to have and, and trying to soak up as much knowledge as you can. Um, some of the best conversations and the best um, projects that I've ever been on were when I partnered with someone who had a totally different background to myself and we found a common language and common knowledge. So I've, I've worked a lot with material scientists in the last 10 years or so and it's a super fruitful experience because I'm coming from a perspective of applications. Like, where, where does this go in the world? How does this fit in the world? And they're coming from a perspective of like having deep knowledge of polymers, for instance, or 
metallurgy or ceramics or whatever their specialization might end up being. And, and when we can find that common language and common knowledge, um, there's this riffing that can happen where it's like, what if, what if, what if you go back and forth. And so, yeah, I would suggest, you know, for, for young uh, material scientists trying to break into the product development realm or into design in some way or innovation. Um, yeah. Like find people who think differently than you and, mm -hmm. and really uh, get close and understand what that means in terms of uh, how they perceive the world and, and what are the, what are the things that they find to be important to think about and what are those, how do you incorporate that into your work stream? Mm -hmm. So this just takes it a little bit further, but how do you go about finding those people, whether it's from the mentor standpoint or just uh, another peer and really just getting those conversations going? I'm a big fan of like radical candor and, and being direct. And like when I was early in my career, um, you know, I found a, a, some folks, they, it was a group called Squid Labs to be specific. Um, and I had read a, a press release that they had done and it was a, a technology they had developed. That was this uh, rope that had an integrated sensor that could tell you how much load was on it. So it was like a smart rope and it just like blew my mind. <laughs> And so I reached out to them. I said, hey, like, I, I, li I live near you. Can I be an intern? How do I, like, how do I get in on this? This is awesome. You know, you hear nothing back. It's standard sort of <laughs> trying to go through the front door situation. Um, and then I found, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the thing called the Maker Fair. Um, it's a, it's like a, a, a big um, uh, event that's held yearly here in the Bay Area, and I think they do it throughout the world in smaller events, but it's like people who are interested in making stuff, they display what they're, what they're excited about in their projects. So I went to the Maker Fair here, and I saw they had a booth, and I was like, oh, these are the guys. <laughs> and so I just like, I was like, you know, the fanboy. I hung out at the booth, and I was like, how do I be an intern? How do I get in, into this? Like, you don't have to pay me. And, uh, and ultimately, I, get, I was able to convince them by like fixing their computers. I was like, all, you know, I'll, I'll fix your computers, I'll run your website, whatever it takes. And that was sort of the foot in the door. And so, you know, I guess the, the moral of the story there, at least from my perspective is, um, find out what you're passionate about and then pursue it and, and be okay with rejection because it's gonna happen. But um, like, yeah, having that conviction and, and, you know, identifying what it is that you're passionate about and just track on it. I love that. And if you can find that intersection between your passion and how you can provide value to that person or that company, that goes a long way to being successful. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I fixed their computers for six months. And then I was like, hey, now that you know me and I've provided some value, like, <laughs> can I start working on these other projects now? And they were like, yeah, absolutely. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Mitch, for coming onto the show today. We learned so much about from your different projects and just the design considerations and the material science principles that came into play. It was, um, it was very insightful. Great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And if any of our listeners want to reach out to you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do so? Um, I believe there's a contact uh, form on my website. If there's not, there will be soon. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, reach out to me through there. Uh, I tend to get back to people within a day or two. Cool. And your website is www.mitchellheinrich.com? That's correct. Great. 